don't see on there, there are we early? We're okay, we're good to go. Well, folks, just let me just give you all a very warm welcome to Cumber Free Presbyterian Church. It's lovely to see you all. We want to warmly welcome those downstairs and those upstairs. We're glad to see you for folks who have been returning again. Some folks still away and will return, God willing, next week. But we're delighted to see you all and a very warm welcome to all who have gathered. To those that are listening and joining with us as well on the social media platforms and, and Sermon Audio and Facebook and YouTube, again, we want to warmly welcome you. Uh, we had the privilege of meeting up with some of you uh, recently and uh, you're over on holiday here in the province and we're able to uh, meet up with you and uh, we're thankful that you are listening and you're encouraging us and we're encouraging you. We pray the Lord will bless you today wherever you are, uh, whether in the building or online, that God would richly bless and meet you at the point of your need. So you're all very warmly welcome. It's good to be back again in the pulpit uh, after uh, the period of holiday and I do thank you sincerely for your prayers. I just want to acknowledge that the Lord has been with us. He is richly blessed. Uh, we had an excellent day here in the church for the wedding of Samuel and Leah. And the Lord certainly encouraged us and blessed us. It was a very relaxed day. And uh, we are thankful to the Lord that uh, the Lord has continued to bless these young ones and many others as well. Uh, there's been seven weddings this year so far. There's another one in September. In fact, it's uh, this Saturday coming, God willing. Uh, there will be a wedding here in the church, Curtis and Chloe. And they've been able to come to the church even in my absence they were here. Their family have gathered and we're looking forward to that day. They trust the Lord will be with us and undertake for us. So we want to thank you sincerely as a family uh, for your thoughts, your care and your prayers, and we do appreciate it very much indeed. So it's good to be back, and we trust the Lord will bless us as we get our uh, heels dug in, and uh, we stand strong for the autumn and winter's work, as we put our hand to the plough afresh, as we commit the work into the hand of the Lord in every department, from the children's work, Sunday school, the youth, the young adults, and uh, the regular meetings, the prayer meetings, the stu Bible studies, the uh, preaching of the gospel and all that we seek to do for the Lord and the various harvest services and special family nights that have been arranged and planned in the will of God. We trust the Lord will be with us and the Lord will bless us richly and encourage our hearts in these days. Returning to the psalm section of our hymn book, it's the 25th psalm. It's the first version, verses 1 to 7. And sometimes we're not familiar with all the psalms and uh, they can be a little tricky to sing, I know. Well, hopefully we've got a good tune for you here. We can sing this to crown him with many crowns. So we'll see how we go with this one. Uh, verses 1 through to 7, the first version of Psalm 25, please. <clears throat> Let's all stand as we sing.
Amen. Uh, thankfully that tune did fit. And uh, I, I can sing some of these tunes to the Psalms. And I break up words, hold on to words, miss out words. And it seems to work for me, but thankfully it worked for you as well. We're going to unite our hearts together in prayer and we'll seek the Lord's face. Loving Father, it is with joy and thanksgiving that we come into thy presence and into thy house. We think of how the psalmist proclaimed, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And we thank thee, O God, that we can enter into the courts of heaven itself. We can gather in a place, O God, such as this. We can Come to thee, Lord, and we're not just coming to the house of God. Lord, that would be something that many do, even the ungodly do. We realize, Lord, there's more than just going to church, coming to the house of God. We realize, Lord, we need to come and get to thee, the God of this house. We think of Lord Bethel, the house of God, and then we think of that compound name, El Bethel, the God of the house of God. And we desire to get beyond the experience of going to church. We desire, Lord, to meet with thee, to fellowship with our God, to commune with the Lord, and to worship thee. We realize, O oh God, that as we would catechize the boys and girls, Lord, and the young people in Christian doctrine, that man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forevermore. And we pray, O oh God, that we will have our souls thrilled with the life and the enjoyment of our Creator God. We pray, Lord, we will draw our spring of joy from thee, and we will have the source of life in thee, that we will delight ourselves in the Lord. And you promise, Lord, that you will give us the desires of our heart. And we desire, O God, to worship thee in the beauty of holiness today. We realize, O God, we could not do that of ourselves or through the rites or rituals of any church. We realize, O God, no sacrament could ever bring us to God. We bless thee for the, the Savior today. For the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. We thank thee for the riches of thy grace at the Lord Jesus Christ's expense. We bless thee for Calvary, for the cross work, the finished work. There's nothing more to pay. It is finished. We thank thee the work is done. It is complete. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. We thank thee that his body was broken and his blood was shed. It was a substitutionary death, a death instead of me. The guilty sinner, O oh God, goes free as Christ is punished in our guilty room instead. We thank thee that he endured the wrath of God. He satisfied every legal requirement of divine law in his life of obedience and his atoning death and sacrifice. He has fulfilled the law of God in its righteousness and its justice and all the legal requirements of that law were fully satisfied in the finished work of Calvary's cross. We thank thee Father, death could not hold its prey. He tore those bars away and up from the grave he arose. He's now exalted to thy right hand, our living head. Oh, that we could see him today. Oh, that we could see the, the majesty and glory of his person and again see the wonder of his work, that we would never lose the thrill of God's so great salvation. Lord, we don't want to be like David for 11 months who was backslidden and lost the joy of thy salvation. We want to be like Nehemiah. He even though the work was hard and there were problems around, there were difficulties ahead, yet he could say the joy of the Lord is your strength. And Lord, we could be like Paul, lying in an old dungeon in a prison, writing to the church at Philippi, the epistle of joy, when he could say rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And even writing to the church at Thessalonica, he could pen to them under inspiration, rejoice evermore. And Lord, we thank thee that we are to not only exalt thee, we're not only to praise and worship and give thanks to thee, but we think of those words, Lord, to extol the Lord. And Lord, that's going further than just praising thee. Lord, we believe it means an enthusiastic, Lord, worship of God. We don't want an old, dead, dry offering today. We don't want, Lord, a lifeless sacrifice. We want to be a living sacrifice on the altar. We want, Lord, to be filled with the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. It doesn't come from looking at our circumstances, that's for sure. It doesn't come, O oh God, even from looking at others, even though they may bless us and some may discourage us. But Lord, we come through the eye of faith upon Christ and our union with him and all that we possess in him. We think of how Obadiah penned it even in his prophecy against Edom when he said, the house of Jacob 
shall possess their possessions. And we ask, Lord, that we might enter in afresh today by faith to all that we have in Christ, the forgiveness of sins. It's ours now. Lord, sometimes we strive looking for it when it's ours through Christ and faith in him. The blood avails for sinful men. It avails for me. And we thank thee, O God, that we have eternal life. We're not looking for it. We have it. We're possessors of it. Now we enter into the joy that, of knowing we'll never be in hell. We'll never be lost. The flames of hell will never singe your hair on our body. It'll never lick around our feet, Lord. We'll never smell the Lord sulfur of hell. We bless thee, O God, that heaven is our eternal home and we're going home to glory soon to see that city bright and we ask oh god there'll be a spring in the step there'll be an encouragement in the heart there'll be a blessing in the soul for thy people we're living in a world that brings us down we're living oh god with lord sin all around us and difficulties and problems we know that and we're facing it every day we need courage lord we need strength and fortitude of mind and and spirit to put the hand to the ply and not look back lord to Lord, go on with God, and no matter what happens around us or to us, and no matter what's threatening, we pray we might stay by the Lord, that we might walk with Christ, Lord. We realize that there's nothing more important in this world, and we could name so much than our relationship with Thee. And Lord, we don't want to be out of touch with God. We don't want to be out of fellowship with the Savior. We don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. So forgive us today, and we take cleansing and forgiveness by faith. And Lord, we have so much in Christ. We have righteousness. We don't have to live a life of righteousness to be accepted with thee. That righteousness Christ established for us in the days of his flesh is now given over to our account. It belongs to us now. We stand in the righteousness of Christ. Lord, that far exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. We stand with unveiled face, even the highest archangel, the holy angels, the seraphims, they veil their faces, crying, holy, holy, holy. And yet in our union with Christ, we're sinners fit forward for hell. Yet with unveiled face, we can look upon our God, even though you're a consuming fire. Such is our union with Christ. Such is, O God, the salvation and redemption that we have in him. Such is thy pardoning grace. Such is the power of the precious blood of the Lamb. It brings us nigh, right into thy holy courts, right before thy face and we're accepted and we're welcomed and we're not cast away all because of our blessed redeemer our savior and our great exalted high priest and we praise thee even now he's praying for each one of us lord if we heard today of individuals who we didn't really know when they mentioned i've prayed for you every day for the last two years lord what a, what a blessing that would be but to think that every moment of every day our Savior remembers me. You're praying for me today. Lord, you're remembering me. You're bringing my need before the Father. The Spirit helps my infirmities and prompts my petitions to even present that need and answers to prayer will come. So encourage us today, Lord, and lift up our hearts and bless. Remember those out of Christ without a Savior. Lord, our hearts go out to them. Lord, we have trembled during our holiday period, meditating on different things in the Word. We've trembled, you know, the trembling of our heart. You know, Lord, how it has moved us when we have considered the place called hell. We've considered how long it will be and the hopelessness and lostness and eternity there is there, the blackness of darkness forever. And Lord, it would do, I believe, every pastor and preacher good to contemplate that awful place called hell on a Saturday night before they'd ever come to preach on the Lord's day. Lord, touch our hearts, we pray. Forgive us for lack of love for souls, for lack of compassion for the lost, and grant that you'll stir our hearts again to reach the youngest and the oldest individual, to share Christ with our fellow man and do what we can with what we have for thine eternal glory to fulfill the Great Commission. We're not unmindful today of those in need. We commend them to thee. We pray for our brother Frank, Lord, as he has returned from hospital for his wife Mary and Neil and the whole family. We bring them to thee, Lord, and pray for them. Remember John and Gemma Hamilton today, Lord. We pray too for Brian. You know the need, the ongoing need. Remember Pat and Ruth as well. We just commit them lovingly to God. We pray too, Lord, for thy gracious hand upon those that are shut in. They never really get out at all. Lord, pray for James Devlin today. 
Remember too, Lord, uh, Ken Brown. Remember Philip and Sandra, the ongoing need, and Sam there, Lord. We just commend them lovingly to thee. Think of John and Martha Ferguson, an ongoing need with Yvonne. We just pray too, Lord, for John and for Nell Kerr. And we just ask, Lord, you remember them. We think of Billy and Muriel Potter. We thank thee for them. We thank thee for Billy's faithfulness to his wife. We pray you'll encourage him, Lord, and undertake for him. Pray for Bobby Moore and Bobby Gibson, Lord, getting on in years, Lord, and would love to be out in the house of God and unable at present. We just commend them to God. Maybe tuning in now, just remember them. Remember that they're in our hearts, they're in our thoughts, and we're bringing them to thee. Bless them today, Lord, and be with them. We pray, Lord, for Frances Hunsdale today. We just pray you'll remember thy servant and undertake for her. We pray, Lord, for Heather and for Hard, Lord, and for David and Faith and the ongoing need. We ask too, Lord, for our sister Diane, that you'll perfect that which concerns her. Thank you, she's back out again, Lord, and we pray you'll continue the healing touch upon her. Remember Owen and Gladys McCart McCartney, Lord. We just pray for Owen especially, and Lord, strengthen Gladys as she tends to her husband. Pray for Sylvia, Lord. We think of ailing and the cancer returning again. We pray, Lord, too, for Raymond Stevenson, Lord, and Rita Peacock. Remember Jason, that you'll save him today. And we pray for Ruth Stewart, Lord, that you'll continue the healing process upon her hand, and soon she'll be strengthened and back to work again. Undertake for Marcus and Lucas, Lord. We commend them to thee. Remember Sarah as well, Lord. Remember Adam. We just bring them to thee, Lord, and pray for them at this time. We pray for Betty, Lord, that you'll continue thy healing touch upon, uh, Lord, the physical frame. Remember our ministers, Lord, that are unwell. Remember the Reverend Beatty today, the Reverend Whiteside. We think of Dr. Lindsay Wilson, and we pray, Lord, for the Reverend Jim Harton, and we just commend them to thee, the Reverend Kevin McLeod, Lord, and the ongoing need. We just bring so many to the Lord and Lord we wouldn't want to leave any out but Lord here are individuals and we don't want them out of sight and we don't want them out of mind Lord we pray for them and we, they're part of the church family here and have been for longer than I have and Lord we just bring them to thee and because they're not able to come doesn't mean they're not valued they are and we don't want to forget them so we bring them to thee and many others and the church family here our wider denomination and many outside of it be pleased to bless today and Lord in answer to prayer be pleased to save souls, restore the backslider, revive the church. We ask these things in the Saviour's precious and worthy name. Amen. Let's turn again in our hymn books, please, to the hymn number 71. We'll sing uh, verses 1, 3, 5, and 6. If we could sing verses 1, 3, 5, and 6 of number 71, Jesus the Sinner's Friend. Verses 1, 3, 5, and 6. Let's all stand as we sing. One, three, five, and six. Good singing. Let's turn in the Bible, please, to the book of Joshua. 
we will be commencing today. I'm not sure when it'll finish. It'll finish when it finishes. Uh, but we're going to commence a study in the life of Joshua. Um, it'll mostly be taken from the book of Joshua, though there are other references as well. It's not an exposition of the book of Joshua, uh, but it is a character study, and we will certainly lean heavily uh, in the book of Joshua. So it'll do no harm for you uh, to look ahead, to read ahead, take out commentaries if you want, take out whatever commentary you want. I could name quite a lot to you. And if you want to study ahead, if you want to look at passages beforehand and that you're better prepared for the ministry of the word, you feel free to do that. And it's good to have an educated congregation and that you don't have to go back to basics. You don't have to go to the ABCs, but you have a, a working knowledge of the book and of the life of Joshua, where he appears, those great events in his life, those historical occurrences, the application to your own life. And then perhaps there's something that you will get that I will miss, maybe something you'll miss and I will get. And together we'll have a collective uh, body of truth and knowledge that will be able to work into our lives. The book of Joshua and the life of Joshua, I believe, will challenge you. And I'll say this to you, prepare to be challenged by studying the life of Joshua. This is a military book, by the way. And there's some people who love to look at albums with all the war machinery, all the planes and the tanks, and some young people are really into that, and they love all the documentaries on war, and they study war. Nations study war. There's not a nation in the world that doesn't study war. I can say this to you, by the way. Israel is probably one of the nations on earth that study war more than any other nation, although Britain and America, NATO, and all uh, those countries that are allied together, and individual countries as well, uh, they all study war. But there's no nation on earth like Israel where they study war every day, tactics. But I will say this to you. Israel draws quite a number of its tactics straight from Scripture. Straight from Scripture. Some of those ambushes, some of those tactics that are used by Israel, you can find it in the Old Testament they felt that it was good enough for Joshua and Moses and for David and for Solomon, for many others. And God gave them tactics to use. They, they follow those biblical principles in their war. And of course, we're not fighting against a physical enemy as such today. Uh, no war is good. We have to say that. No matter how just it may seem, no war is good. War is not good. But there is a war that's good. And that is the Christian warfare. In fact, Paul said, you're to fight, listen to it, the good fight. It's the only good fight you'll ever fight. There's no good fight. No matter if you win, there's no good fight. I hear people saying of a boxing match, oh, it was a great fight. It was a good fight. It wasn't. Somebody got hammered. <laughs> Black and blue. Somebody got knocked clean out. Nearly got their brains knocked out. And there's nothing good about a fight, believe me. And even if you win that fight... Or even if that fight stopped, there's nothing good about a fight. And there's nothing good about a war. But there is a fight that is good. And it's called the good fight of faith. And that's what you have in the book of Joshua. It's a military book. In fact, it has everything to do with Christian warfare. Not only does it teach us why sometimes evangelical churches are unproductive. Why some believers do not grow in grace. It's all in the book of Joshua. But it also encourages and inspires us to the way of victory and to triumph over our enemies, revealing God's mind and will and having our heavenly Joshua, the captain of our salvation, the one to whom the earthly Joshua submitted even in this book and asked him who he was. Was he with us or against us? And he cried as captain of the Lord's host, I am here. And Joshua fell at his feet. It was Christ appearing to Joshua, heading up the armies of God, the legions of angels and the soldiers of the cross, the captain of our salvation and the one who leads his people from victory on to victory. Well, that's what you find in the book of Joshua. I'm only just priming the pump just a little and I trust that you will get into the book, get your teeth into it, study it, and maybe even at the door and say, you missed an awful lot today. And I'll, be, I'll take that rebuke and I'll get more into the study and I'll spend more hours and I'll stop playing golf every day and get into the study. 
I'm only jesting. <laughs> but I, I want you to really look at this and study it. I trust the Lord will bless you richly as we take up this uh, character study on Joshua and as we look at the book together. Joshua chapter 1 then, just a few verses there from 1 to 9. Joshua chapter 1 verse 1, let us all read together and hear the word of the Lord. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give them, to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses, from this, or from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Amen. Blessed words indeed. May the Lord bless this word to all of our hearts. We're going to ask our clerk of session, Mr. Jackie Allister, if you come forward, please. He's going to make some necessary announcements. Thank you. Well, it is good to welcome everyone uh, out to our service this morning. As of course we're into September and you feel as if things are getting back to normal. It is good to see uh, such a number uh, gathered out this morning. We do welcome you. There are some visitors with us and we do want to extend that uh, warm welcome to you uh, to our service this morning. I do remember, uh, of course, our gospel service this evening at 7 p.m. Uh, and uh, the Reverend Martin will be with us again, God willing, uh, for our gospel service this evening. And there will be a special singing uh, by the Brook Quartet, so do keep that in mind, please. Uh, then could I mention as well, that this incoming week, I really should have uh, mentioned this last Lord's Day, uh, but uh, time passes so quickly that this one crept up on me. But this incoming week has been set aside by our session uh, as a week of prayer here in the church. Uh, so Monday through to Friday, we'll be meeting each evening at 8 p.m. Uh, for a season of prayer. So just uh, with the recommencement of the work, the beginning of the winter's work, as it were, uh, we feel the need uh, to seek the Lord and commit it all to him uh, and to seek his blessing upon the endeavors uh, that lay ahead of us. Uh, so do keep that in mind, and if you can, uh, be out night by night, 8 p.m. <clears throat> then on Friday, uh, can I mention our seniors' meeting? Uh, once again, uh, this is our monthly meeting. I have a break over the summer, but resuming uh, this uh, week again at 11.30 a.m., the seniors' meeting. Uh, God willing, the Reverend Stanley Barnes will be along to speak at that meeting. And of course, afterwards we get lunch together, so keep that in mind. There is that list uh, still out in the uh, hall of the church. Uh, if you would add your name to it, if you're able to come, 
and that's really just to help with uh, numbers to plan for the catering. So please remember that, uh, if you would. Then on Friday evening, uh, again, the Youth Fellowship resumes uh, this Friday evening at uh, 8 p.m., so keep that in mind as well. Uh, can I mention, of course, the services next Lord's Day at the normal times, uh, Sunday school and Bible class, quarter past ten, of course, the Sunday school resumed this morning, uh, and there seemed to be a good number out, so that's good, uh, but I'm sure there are others that we could encourage uh, and get them out as well. So remember the Sabbath school, quarter past ten next week. The two services, half past eleven and seven p.m., and God willing, the Reverend Martin will be with us for both services next Lord's Day. Uh, it is, uh, it will be the second uh, Lord's Day of the month, which, as you know, is the day that we take up our monthly missionary offering. Uh, so that will be taken up uh, next Lord's Day. Uh, and this month, that offering will be going towards the missionary council of our denomination. Uh, then uh, the after uh, church meeting uh, in the church here next uh, Lord's Day evening, 8.45. That's for the young adults, not just of our own congregation, uh, but this is the United uh, Young Adults as they come together once a month uh, from the churches round about uh, this particular area. So do remember that, young folks, uh, that that will be taking place next Lord's Day. <clears throat> uh, one or two other things. I have different pieces of paper this morning, which is always uh, a risky thing because I can forget something. Uh, but can I mention the uh, Let the Bible Speak record? This has been mentioned uh, before the summer break, uh, really, and there has been a list in the Hall of the Church there. Uh, on Monday, the 12th of September, uh, that's Monday week, uh, we will be, uh, as many as possible, uh, if you could make your way down to uh, our, the recording studio down there in our Lurgan congregation, uh, there will be some TV recordings going on that evening. Uh, and we want as many as possible down from Cumber uh, to make up the congregation on that occasion. Uh, so do keep that in mind. Uh, we are planning on that week uh, that we will move our prayer meeting uh, forward from the uh, Tuesday to the Monday evening and all travel down together uh, to Lurgan. So if you can go, please add your name to the list there in the Hall of the Church. We would plan to take at least the minibus. If you need to transport, if you need to go by bus, uh, perhaps you'll just indicate that against your name. <clears throat> and even those who have already uh, listed their names there, if you need to travel by bus, uh, please indicate that on the sheet, please. Uh, and that'll uh, indicate to us whether we can uh, accommodate those who need transport in the minibus or whether we need to get uh, something bigger, but do keep that in mind for Monday, the 12th uh, of September. <clears throat> uh, can I mention as well, as you know, we've been announcing for the past few weeks uh, for volunteers for catering teams. I want to thank uh, everyone for the good response there has been to that. Uh, there's at least 40 names on that list at, at the moment, and that is very encouraging. In the past, uh, we had four teams. Uh, but with the numbers that we have, I believe we'll be able to make up five strong teams for uh, the catering uh, in the congregation here. Uh, if there are those who have been away uh, and you haven't been able to add your, your name, uh, then we will leave that sheet out uh, for today. And after that, we'll be uh, taking it up and getting the teams organized. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, can I mention the Vision magazines? They're available and they're uh, in the porch as well. Uh, we provide those free of charge, so uh, take a copy with you, uh, if you would, please. Then a couple of things uh, just for uh, the future. Uh, first of all, uh, for the young folks, uh, this coming Friday, Friday the 9th, uh, there is the Youth Co uh, Council Rally uh, over in our Hillsborough uh, church, so do keep that in mind. Youth Council Rally this coming Friday at 8 p.m. And just looking a wee bit further forward for her own congregation here, uh, on the 18th of September, that's just uh, two weeks away, 
uh, there will be a special testimony uh, evening uh, at the evening service, uh, and Kira Arnold uh, will be along to testify, uh, and on that night as well, her brother Stephen Anderson uh, will be ministering in song. I hope I've got them all, and I hope you can remember them all. Thank you. Certainly don't want to repeat any of those announcements. We're thankful to our brother for making them. I uh, always understand coming back after the summer and also after our press ready meeting that the announcements can be a little bit longer. But we thank you for your patience and the announcements are subject as always to the divine will of the Lord. Could I emphasize the let the Bible speak? Uh, those television broadcastings will be on the uh, Monday night. It starts at 8 o'clock, so obviously we need to get down and we'll give you the times a little later on down to Lurgan. And you can get a cup of tea before you start. And we're encouraged to say to our lady folk, we want young people as well to join with us. If you can, you join with us. You're to wear bright clothing. And uh, ladies, you don't have to wear big hats, and we don't have that problem here. So maybe just a berry or something like that would be sufficient. And obviously, you'd want to. Uh, sing when you're singing, sing with all your heart. You don't want a sour face. The camera will be on you. And uh, when it does come round your way, don't look into it and don't freeze. Don't go like that. So just pretend it's not there, although they will be sweeping past you. Uh, they've asked me to preach. I'm not sure if I'm doing all three. Just forget now. But I start at seven o'clock and they said to me, would you come and do the broadcast as well? Certainly. He says, well, you're starting at seven and there's going to be nobody there. So that's what it's come to for me. Uh, starting at seven with no congregation and just be preaching to about six cameras and uh, they say I have a good face for radio I don't know about television but I'll be there and be preaching the gospel preaching to believers and I think I'm sharing it leading it as well with the Reverend David Stewart so thankfully there may be two congregations mixing there and that'll add to the numbers we're changing the prayer meeting from the Tuesday night to the Monday night and we want to encourage as many as possible and the young ones downstairs and you uh, youth and young ones up there in the gallery if you're free and you can get along you'll be made very very welcome we emphasize as well young people on friday evening in the will of the lord there is that uh, national rally the annual youth rally over in hillsborough at eight o'clock and we would encourage you to go over there and join with those young people uh, for fellowship and for the preaching of the word of god let's turn again to their hymn books before we come to the preaching of the word 509 this time 509 we'll stand together as we sing i love i love my master i will not go out free <clears throat> let's all stand as we worship
praise the Lord. That's good singing. We really do appreciate that. Let's turn in our Bibles to Joshua chapter 1. With our Bibles open before us, let's again seek the Lord's face for help in the ministry of the Word. Father, we thank Thee for worship today, the singing of these hymns and the psalm. We thank Thee, Lord, for the offering of prayer, the collective and individual and audible and silent worship of Thy dear people. We thank Thee, Lord, for the reading of Holy Scripture, and we rejoice in all Thy goodness and grace to us. And now as we come to the opening of thy word and the preaching forth of the message, as we begin in the life of Joshua and in this book and elsewhere, we pray, Lord, you will open our eyes to behold wondrous things from out of thy law. Give help in the pulpit and in the pew. Give help, Lord, at home and in the study. And grant, Lord, that time will be given to the word and that the word will be profitable, being mixed in with faith in those that hear it. And we pray that even this series will be used not only to edify and revive and glorify the church in Christ, but, Lord, we pray that it will be used in the salvation of the lost. We pray, Lord, you will answer prayer now and be pleased in answer to our prayer to give me, thy servant, that cleansing through the blood. I pray for the infilling of the Spirit of the living God. I ask for that endowment, that anointing, I pray, Lord, for that mighty empowering of the Holy Spirit to rightly divide the word of truth, to preach the message, and, Lord, to deal with the word of life. Grant to me wisdom and skill, help and understanding. Take me out of my insufficiency and inability, human weakness, as I cast myself upon divine omnipotence. God, grant that thou wouldst now fill me with wisdom and power in the handling of thy word. And, Father, in answer now to prayer, save the lost restore the backslidden, revive the church, and glorify thy dear Son. And the people of God said, Amen. The book of Joshua and the life of Joshua really is primarily a book for the Christian life. I don't think for one moment it's dry history. It certainly isn't. I don't think for one moment that it only relates to a certain period in history or a certain nation. No, it doesn't. It's a spiritual book. It's a military book. And it is primarily a book for the Christian life from conversion until you die and the Lord calls you home or the Lord returns again and you enter into your eternal rest. It was designed by God, we believe, to help and encourage young believers, that is, the youngest of those who have been saved, those who know and love Christ, even the children, the boys and girls and the young people. It is a book designed to help you and to encourage you as you face the trials of life, as you grow up as a young believer in a wicked world, that you might know how to live your life well-pleasing unto God. It's also a book for the mature believer because it has enough detail uh, to challenge and to strengthen your faith and mine, even the seasoned believer, the one who feels maybe he has read it before, he has heard it before. There are things here, I believe, that will inspire they will challenge and they will convict and they certainly will encourage you in your faith. The book of Joshua covers a very small period of time. It's not into hundreds of years. In fact, it only covers uh, about 30 years of history. Uh, it seems to be so much is packed in there. Uh, sadly, the book of Joshua, I believe, gives to us some of the reasons why God's people fail. In fact, in the days of Joshua, during those 30 years, they did not conquer the land of Canaan, that conquest of the land. They did not enter into their possessions. In fact, right throughout history, right up until I think the only time, the only time in history was during the reign of Solomon, when most of the land, not all the land, was possessed, even though God told them to go in and to enter into that promised land, into the land of Canaan, and they were to uh, destroy their enemies and they were to live uh, for the Lord and conquering those enemies. And the land was theirs. It was given to them. Even to this day, sadly, Israel. Israel gives up the land to the Palestinian. I don't believe for one moment that Israel, as a government, as a nation, has any right to give that land back. I don't believe for one moment that Israel should have given the land to the Palestinians. God gave it to them. They should have stayed in it. They should have taken more. I'm not a man for war, but Israel are giving their land away and they ought not to do that. God had given and he told even in Joshua where that land would be. He gave the very borders of that land. And if you look at it today, Israel do not possess that land even to this day. 
And I'm not going into all the prophecy, but there's no doubt when the Lord returns, the land will be fully taken by Israel. We know that spiritually, the book relates to us spiritually. And it is basically taking our possessions, going into our inheritance, all that we have in Christ and in some Christians' lives and some churches' lives. They don't enter in. They don't take the land. They don't claim that which is theirs in Christ that has been given to them by God. And for years they live in poverty. They live in defeat when all the time there's victory for them covering as this book does some 30 years of Israel's history, yet its purpose is not to detail every aspect of those 30 years and to give us a detailed examination of what Joshua had to eat, what time he went to bed when he got up, and who he met and who he befriended, and who was his family members, who was his uh, uh, cousins, and so on and so on. It doesn't go into those details because the Bible is an inspired book, not just a history record. It's an inspired book. In fact, I believe it only gives to us that which the Spirit of God would want for our learning and for our instruction. You would know that it takes its name from the one who is the main character in the book, and that is Joshua, the successor to Moses, the servant of the Lord. And his name means Jehovah the Saviour. It was changed in the book of Numbers to Jehovah the Saviour. He was originally known as Oshea, which means salvation. And they put the Lord's name in, those consonants of Jehovah, into his name. And he became known as Jehovah the Savior. And he's a picture and a type of Christ as he leads his people into the promised land, Canaan. And Canaan is not heaven. Canaan is this world in which we live. And the enemies, the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Hivites, the Hittites and all, the Jebusites are all enemies in the land. And we are to go in and possess the world, the flesh, the devil, and all the God-defying, Christ-rejecting world. The world without God is society without God. And we are to battle against the flesh, the world, and the devil. We'll see that. The theme of this book is what is known as the conquest of Canaan. And there is a book, and I would commend it to your reading if it's still in print. I don't think it's still in print. But if you can get your hands on it, it's what is known as the conquest of Canaan. Was it moral or immoral? By Dr. Peter Masters of the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London. See, it's Spurgeon's old church. And you have individuals today, and Christians can't answer them. I've listened to the debate between those who are called evangelical those who claim to represent evangelical truth and the strange thing in all their debates, the strange thing, whether it's the Lord's Day, whether it's the abortion issue, whether it's the sodomite issue, they never introduce the Word of God, yet they're called the representatives of evangelicalism, and they never mention the Word of God. Isn't that amazing? But one thing the enemy does, and it's this. Well, sure, you're talking about abortion, are you? Are you against abortion? Yes, I am. Well, your God, that's what they say. Your God killed more children than we did. Read the Old Testament. Look at the babies that were killed. Look at the children that were slaughtered. And then you're telling us. And there's not one Christian can answer them. Not one Christian that I've heard. Now, there may be Christians who have answered them. There may be publications out there that I haven't read or that I haven't heard. There may be Programs that I haven't tuned into, that's true. But the ones that I have, there's no answer. And then they say, well, that was immoral. Why did God kill the children? Well, Joshua, the book of Joshua answers that question. The conquest of Canaan. Was it moral or immoral? I want to tell you something. It was just and it was moral. In fact, God used... God used the Israelites to punish those nations. Such was their wickedness, their immorality. They sacrificed their children, their children to the fire of Molech. They butchered and killed without mercy any person that stood in their way. They had no law. They had reached the height of iniquity and they aggravated the wrath of God. And God used Israel as an instrument of judgment upon those nations. And God destroyed those nations. Not so Israel could take their land. But because of their wickedness. 
And if the children were left, they would grow up to be like their parents. And God ordered the destruction of the entire nation. Such was their wickedness. And I want to tell you something. I don't care what the abortionists or the sodomites say about the Old Testament and about my God. The conquest of Canaan and Joshua and the Israelites was just. And it was moral because the moral governor and the just one ordered it because he was punishing those nations. And it clearly teaches in the Pentateuch and in the bridging book called Joshua, before you come into the book of Judges, Joshua is like a bridge. That's what it is to link the Pentateuch to the reign of the judges in the life of, his, of the history, a life and history of Israel. And there it is, bridging that gap, revealing to us the conquest of Canaan and God's will for Israel to enter into the land and to be his instrument of judgment righteously on the nation. That's why God left the Canaanite in the land to prove Israel and sometimes as a punishment to Israel for their sin and their failure. Its application today, that is the book of Joshua, relates to the Christian life and warfare. It is possessing our possessions, claiming that which is rightfully ours. Therefore, it is a military book preserving for us not only the record of Joshua's battles for the Lord, but his victories that we might be encouraged to live from victory on to victory. Thus it serves as a powerful example and an incentive for us to battle for Christ against his and our enemies, the world, the flesh and the devil, the three great enemies of the church and of the child of God. Dr. Peter Masters in that book, The Conquest of Canaan, had this to say, I quote, We find in the book of Joshua the reason why Bible-believing churches today so are sometimes unsuccessful. Why individual Christians often make little progress in their spiritual lives. But Joshua goes much further than that. Just exposing our weaknesses. For it is crowded with powerful encouragements and promises. Unquote. Arthur Walkington Pink, or A.W. Pink as he was known. One of the greatest evangelical writers in his day. Though he became an eccentric and shut himself away like a, a monk at the end. But A.W. Pink, whose writings are tremendous, even to this day you feel the impact of them when you study his writings. From his book called Gleanings in Joshua, he had this to say, I quote, As Israel's entrance into Canaan marked the beginning of their life of conquest, so at conversion, do you see how he applies the book? He applies the book as Israel, there's the picture, as they entered and came out of Egypt and they entered into the promised land, he says that's a picture of the child of God at conversion. He leaves the Egypt of this world and he enters in to all that the Lord has promised in Christ to him. So at conversion, we begin that good fight of faith, which is required before we can enter in to our eternal rest, unquote. John G. Butler, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, I'm not sure if he's still alive. Uh, I, along with six others, were the first in Northern Ireland ever to import his Bible character books. The first in Northern Ireland. Six of us. And he got the postage wrong and we got them for nothing. Imported those books. And then we distributed some to individuals who were in small works and small churches to encourage them in the faith. He's increased it to the red volume, studies on the Saviour, and to the green volume, and to the brown volume. And he deals with the parables and all the miracles, and he certainly deals with so many biblical characters. He has one of those books, I'm not sure what number it is, but in Bible characters, John G. Butler is a fundamentalist American writer. He said this, I quote, the study of this gallant character is most inspiring. Joshua demonstrates that we can live victoriously in this wicked world. Joshua's life points us upward to heavenly help in living victoriously and shows us the key to victory, which is our relationship with God, unquote. Alan Rod Redpath in his a book called Victorious Christian Living, if you can get your hands on that as well, a lot of reading for you. He said this, I quote, you will see that this book of Joshua will open up for us what will be to many new possibilities of spiritual victory and new secrets 
of the way of blessing, unquote. So it's abundantly clear that all these authors and many other commentators and Bible students viewed the book of Joshua as an encouragement to the Christian soldier who are, who's battling for the Lord as an incentive to Christian warfare and a powerful inspiration when studied and prayed over for a life of victory over our enemies in this present evil world. Under the leadership of Joshua, Israel were led into their inheritance and the land was divided in his day into the tribes and they were to go in and possess that land and claim that land as their inheritance, God-given. And then to claim victory over their enemies. So under the leadership of our heavenly Joshua, even a child can understand that. Under the leadership of Christ the King, under the leadership of the captain of our salvation, we are led from victory unto victory. We often sing the little chorus. How true is it in our lives? In the name of Jesus, we have the victory. Christ, the captain of our salvation, will teach us through this book the necessity, the necessity of spiritual warfare, of engaging the enemy and fighting that good fight, that good fight of faith. Engaging the foes of the gospel, waging war on the world. I listen to it, and the flesh, and then the devil, and all that oppose and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Obadiah, in his prophecy, and he prophesied the destruction of Esau, which is Edom. If you ever read the book of Obadiah, I'd love to ask you now to put your hand up. Have you ever read the book of Obadiah? We studied it in the Minor Prophets, so maybe you did read it. You're going to meet him someday in heaven. And he's going to say, I'm Obadiah. And you might say, which one are you? Because there's about 14 in Scripture. I'm the one that wrote the book. Oh, why, that book? Aye. I never got around to reading it. I sure was only saved 70 years. You will meet him. Nice to read it. He prophesied against Edom, which is really Esau. Became a real encouragement to Israel. And Obadiah said these words, and I believe there was a present application. I believe there was a spiritual application. And there is a prophetical one, a future one. And he said these words in verse 17 of his prophecy in relation to the destruction of the Edomites by Israel. He said, and the house of Jacob. Now remember, he uses a term, the house of Jacob. He didn't say the house of Israel. And that's how I would write it. And I would be wrong. He says the house of Jacob. Jacob is the name in the flesh. Jacob is the, the name of those that are defeated. Jacob is the supplanter. And he is the individual who's weak and fleshly and carnal. And when God refers to Israel as Jacob, he's referring to them in their failure. And here's a word to Jacob, to Israel in their failure. The house of Jacob. The house of defeat. The house of failure. God says, the house of Jacob, even though you have failed, you will be victorious. For the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. They will possess the land. It will happen, yes, in history. And through those reigns of the kings and David and Solomon, and they came closest during the reign of Solomon to literally possessing all the land. There was only a little part of the land they didn't possess during the reign of Solomon. But it has a spiritual application because the house of Jacob, though we feel defeated at times, though we feel weak and vulnerable and the enemy strong, yet we shall possess our possessions and its future. For the church and for Israel will enter into all the covenant promises of God. So it is the will of God for the church then in this introduction to the book that we are a militant body. The church is an army. We are an army. We're soldiers in the army. The book of Joshua will challenge us greatly and best of all it will inspire us to possess our possessions. So let's be prepared to be challenged and inspired by this book and, this, and the life of this man. And with God's help, we want to look at the book of Joshua and we want to study the life of Joshua and I pray it will be a blessing to your heart. Firstly, and this is all I want to do today, 
Firstly, and that's all I'm saying, not saying secondly or thirdly. Firstly, I want you to think of how Joshua is introduced to us in Scripture. That's always, point, uh, always uh, a valid point. Now, I don't want to get smart here, but we had a class in Bible college, and it was called hermeneutics. I want to tell you, when I first entered into that Bible college, there were words I couldn't spell. I, could, I still can't spell. Talk to my wife. I still can't spell. Do you know when you're typing up the wee red squiggly line, it's there all the time for me. I even argue against the computer. I remember Dr. Douglas giving me a word, and I wrote it. It was the word received. You know this one, I after E and E and I and all this, so I spelled it wrong, obviously. And so he, he, he made all these corrections, and when you made a spelling mistake, you had to write it out ten times. Boys, was my hand sore. Ten times for every spelling mistake. And even if it was the same word, you wrote it out ten times. And I gave him the same spelling that I had originally given him, the wrong one, because I thought, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I know how to spell this. And that's how you spell it. And I spelled it like that all my life. And I was taught, you know, <laughs> in Carrick School, <laughs> and Lurgan Boys Junior High, how to spell the word received. And he doesn't know how to spell it. So I just gave it back to him about a hundred times. I remember him standing up in class and he says, you know, there are, there are students in this college and they think they can spell. And I was wondering who that is. <laughs> and he says they even think that the word that they spelled, which is wrong, is still right. And they've given me back and he's me. Oh no, that's me. That's the word received. It's got to be. I still can't spell it, by the way. <laughs> but I want to tell you this. In hermeneutics, we were stu- I couldn't even spell the word, but I studied it. And what it, what it is simply is the, the rules of interpreting Scripture. It really governs the interpretation of Scripture. And, and one thing I was taught in hermeneutics was this. Always look for the first mention of anything in the Bible. It's an indication, always an indication, of that thing in Scripture And then you look not only for the first mention, but then you look for a further mention. Find out where else it is in Scripture and study it and you'll get the picture. And then there's the final mention. Go to the last place in your Bible where that thing is mentioned. Go to the first place. There it is. It's introduced into Scripture. How did God introduce it? You'll get the picture. And God very rarely contradicts the first introduction of that word, that scene. That passage, that thought, that person, that event, he very rarely, if ever, and further mention and final mention, changes the first introduction. One of the classic examples is to find out where the first mention of drunkenness is in the Bible. And you will soon discover that every other instance which God condemned in the first one, he condemns in everyone else, and even in the final one, in the book of the Revelation, when the harlot made the nations of the earth drunk with the wine of her fornication, that is, her relationship with the anti-Christ and church. But I will say this to you, the first mention of Joshua and how he's introduced, you've got to remember Joshua was not born in Israel. He was not born in the land of Canaan. Joshua was born in Egypt. He was one of the captives. One of the captives that sprang from the fact that Jacob went down into Egypt. And Israel sojourned there for some 480 years. And during that time, Joshua was born along with Caleb in the land of Egypt. That's where they were born. And they came out. They're the only two adults of that entire generation, the only two adults of that entire generation of 40 years that actually came out of Egypt and entered into the promised land. Caleb and Joshua were the only two. So remember, he was the only adult along with Caleb to actually leave the land of Egypt and enter into the land of Canaan under the leadership of Moses. Now the first mention of Joshua in Holy Scripture is not found in the book of Joshua. It's actually found in the book of Exodus. And if you turn with, your, with me in your Bible, you haven't too far to turn. And I don't multiply Bible references and, until you're sick, sore, and tired of turning over your Bible. 
But I want you to look there at Exodus chapter 17. And there you will find the first mention of Joshua in your Bible. Exodus 17 and the verse 9. And you notice what it says. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men, and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So the first introduction, he is introduced first of all as a soldier. And no wonder his books, a military book, I told you, generally the first mention in hermeneutics and the study and interpretation of the Bible, when you see someone introduced, study that first mention. And you've discovered already that he's introduced as a soldier. He's introduced in warfare. Is it any wonder that further mentions of Joshua would be linked with the first mention? That is, warfare. He was a soldier. He's introduced as a soldier here in Exodus. A few months after, only a few months, they had left Egypt. They circumvented the land of Edom. The Edomites would not permit them to go through. And remember, Edom is a name for Esau. And Esau was Jacob's brother. So they were a brother to Israel. And they forbid them to go across their land. And God didn't let them go in and take the Edomites. Because he swore that Mount Seir would be given to Esau. And even though Esau was wicked and a rebel. And they wouldn't let Israel go through the land. God forbid them to kill the Edomites at that point. Because he had made a covenant to give them the land. It was only in the days of Obadiah. When their wickedness against God. And their boasting against the Lord. Literally forced the Lord to destroy them. But I want to tell you this. Joshua is introduced as a soldier. They circumvented the land of Edom. And then as they were in the wilderness and they were camped, the Amalekites came and started to pick off the stragglers and the weak and the vulnerable and the aged. And eventually Moses said to Joshua, Choose you out, men. Go into the valley and fight with Amalek. I'll go up to the hill. I'll take Aaron and her with me. I'll hold the rod of God, a symbol of power, in my hand. And you'll fight in the valley and I'll pray for victory on the mountain top. And we know that whenever Moses' hands were held up, Joshua discomforted Amalek. And when Moses' hands fell down, Amalek discomforted Joshua. And you can see here Joshua battling while others were praying. Laborers together in the war battling for the Lord. And so after a few months, they left. They camped around about at Rephidim, near Mount Sinai, before the law was given. At this place, at that place, Amalek attacked the people for the first time in Israel's history. They encountered the enemy. And I want to tell you, friends, Moses quickly mobilized his forces. And he saw a great victory that day through prayer and through battling. The spiritual picture, I believe, is very clear. Christian warfare commences the moment you're saved. If you didn't believe in a devil, in a personal devil, and I believe you did before you were saved, after you were saved, you knew there was a devil on this earth. Oh, you knew full well. The devil left you alone before because you're on your merry way to hell. Why would he like to make life uncomfortable for you? Make you think about God? No. Oh, listen, you're a Christian soldier. Young person, don't you be surprised. If at school you're ostracized. Young person, I don't know if you're starting big school. I don't know whether you're going into college now and further education. I don't know. And some of you are going uh, to university. Some may even, we've heard of so many this past while, who are traveling over. They're traveling over to the mainland. We know of some been in contact who are coming over to the province here. We're trying to link them up with the students in Belfast. But don't you be surprised, young person, when you leave your parental Christian home and your church fellowship and your Christian friends that you're ostracized, you're picked on, you're literally uh, the object of people's wrath and scoffing and they mock the way you dress, the way uh, you have your demeanor, the way you conduct yourself, the things you say, the things you believe. Don't be surprised when the world, the flesh and the devil come against you. No sooner are you saved, young person. No sooner do you know the Lord as your Savior. Remember, it was only a few months after leaving Egypt. It's a type of conversion. They entered into Canaan. They met the Amalekites. And the Amalekites and Amalek is a type of the devil. 
In Scripture, it's a type of the devil. And the devil came against them right away. And don't be surprised if the devil comes against the church. And he comes against the congregation. And he comes against the Sunday school. And the young people's work. And the young adults. And the children's work. And the prayer meetings. And the Bible study. And the regular meetings. And the outreach. Don't be surprised that you've been doing your open airs as we have uh, doing this past while over the summer months every single week. And I, I don't think there's been a Sunday that we can remember that the devil hasn't attacked. And there's been some, whether by people coming out onto the street or people doing things in front of you. And what we've seen it happen and, and there's some things happen when I wasn't there and when I was on holiday. And there's emails have come in, vicious emails of those who mock and laugh at the Bible and they tell us cheekily, and proudly tell us, you stay in your own building and do your preaching. Don't be coming out here. Who do they think they are? They use social media, the public platform, to do theirs. But don't you do it. You stay in your church, that little church over there, and don't come out of it. And do all your preaching in there because nobody wants you. I don't believe that's true for a moment. Go ye out into all the world and preach the gospel. The devil will come. We're to fight the good fight of faith. In fact, he said to young Timothy, he was only a young fella in the ministry. He was only a young pastor. We don't know what age Timothy was. He could have been in his early 20s. And he said this, Paul said this writing to him. Thou therefore endure hardness. Wow. We like to wrap our young people in cotton wool. Oh, you don't want them to face the rigors of the world too soon. When's time to face the rigors of the world? When they're 30? I can tell you, if a young person hasn't borne the yoke in his youth, when he's 30, he'll be a wimp. I hope there's no 30-year-old wimp here today. <laughs> I hope you haven't had an argument at home and your mum or dad says, you're a wimp. I want to tell you something. You need to bear the yoke in your youth. Face the devil. Face the world. As a young believer, as a child, deal with your temper. That's the flesh. Deal with your anger when you don't get your way. That's the flesh. Fight against it. It's a good fight. Overcome it in the Savior's name. Obey your parents in the Lord for it's right. Battle. Fight. Endure as a good soldier. I don't want to labor the point here because we will deal with it at length. But we'll be considering these battles as we study the life of Joshua. And therefore we are. We are to literally put on the whole armor of God. I don't want to labor the point, but I'll finish here because a few other ways he's introduced into Scripture and we look at that next Lord's Day. But he's introduced as a soldier here because he's battling for the Lord. And child of God, didn't Paul tell the church at Ephesus that we are to put on the whole armor of God? The British army recently, whenever they were fighting in Iraq, they were complaining that there wasn't enough supply sent out. The boots that they had made were wrong. They weren't suited to the heat of the desert. They were crumbling. Their feet were blistering. They couldn't walk. They couldn't march. They couldn't go out in operations. They told them that some of the weaponry they had sent out was outdated. And they need new stuff, up-to-date stuff. And it was no good for the purpose that they were fighting and the battle that they were waging against the enemy. And some feel that the British government failed the cream of our young people in those days in Afghanistan and Iraq, even in some peace, time of peace and peacekeeping operations. Can you imagine the Christian army being ill-equipped? But we're not. We, the Bible says we have the whole armor of God, the whole armor. And we are to put on the belt of truth. We're to put on the breastplate of righteousness. We're to have the helmet of salvation. Our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We're to have the shield of faith to quench every fiery dart of the wicked one. And the sword of the spirit. And if that's not all, we're to put each piece on with prayer. I wonder, if you saw today the British army, and there were your relations, it was your son, it was your daughter, and you saw them on the television, and you said, there's my daughter, I'm so proud. She's no gun. What? She's going to war with no gun? There's my son. I'm so proud. Look at him. And, and he's no boots. What on earth is going on? You'd be horrified. I wonder as I close. 
as I look around now, just at the people of God, and maybe those on the internet as well, if you'll afford me your attention in the closing moments. When there's a child of God here, and you have no belt of truth on. Maybe there's someone up in the gallery there, and you have no breastplate of righteousness on today. Maybe someone here in the middle, and you have no sword of the Spirit. No shield of faith. Your feet are not shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You're not ready to serve. God was to call for service. You wouldn't respond. And yet, the book of Joshua is all about Christian warfare, being ready and prepared. And God has made the preparation for us. Put on the whole armor of God. Did you put it on, preacher? Yes, I did. Every piece this morning. Named it before God and put it on. Every piece. And each piece I put on with prayer. For there's a battle. And I trust the Lord that encourages as we wage war on the enemy. So he's first of all introduced as a soldier. We look at how scripture introduces him elsewhere. Loving Father, as we have commenced the study, make it a blessing to us. May we leave the house tonight, or today, Lord, uh, with thy blessing upon us. Encourage us as we part. May we know that blessing that maketh rich and addeth no sorrow with it. Come with us now and go before us. And Father, answer prayer in Jesus' precious and most worthy name. Amen.